When I was growing up, nobody thought I was going to become a writer. I mean, that, <laughs> especially if you talk to those early teachers, I, uh, I struggled a bit to learn how to read. I had to go out for extra reading support and speech therapy, too, because I had a speech impediment when I was a little kid. When I did crack the reading code, I became that kid who was always in the library. I became a voracious reader, but I was not really great at paying attention in class. And I was never fond of English because I, I'm not good at grammar, I couldn't spell, and as I grew older, I hated when they would make us analyze books. <laughs> um, yeah, that's when God laughed, I think, and decided to make me into an author. I, I was the kid who actually did question a teacher about symbolism and claimed that it didn't exist, so this is my penance. Uh, but in, in second grade, I had a wonderful teacher who taught us how to write haiku, and I liked it because it was short and that meant my chances of spelling the words correctly were enhanced because I would always choose words that I knew how to spell. I didn't want to take that risk of being ashamed by spelling words incorrectly. And my teacher just in her own brilliant way explained that I could write down how I was feeling in this structured poem and then the person who would read it would understand what I was feeling. And she said it much better than that. Very, very lovely woman. And I can remember where I was sitting in her classroom when I had that moment because I wrote a poem about my cat. And it was just like this raw, great triumph. And my head just cracked open, you know, and I was like, oh, I can do this. I was very fortunate when I was a little girl because my father is a natural born storyteller. Um, maybe it's from the Irish heritage. Um, my father's a poet. Um, and when I was, as a child growing up, he was always writing poetry and crumpling it up and rewriting poetry. And at the dinner table, in addition to being you know, a storyteller and a poet, he's a minister. And I think all those three things are connected quite deeply. Um, so my father would, at, at dinner, uh, talk to us about the roots of words in different languages. And he would talk to us about how you know, language is connected. And that absolutely had a huge influence on me because I went on to earn a degree in college in linguistics. Um, but what I liked most about my dad was um, those stories that he would tell, especially like the gossipy stories about the family. And I loved the way our living room was laid out, the way our house was laid out in the house where I was a little girl. I, they'd put me to bed and I'd wait for my sister to go to sleep and then I would creep down the stairs and sit at the, uh, on the stairs and just listen to him tell stories um, about everybody so I knew all the good dirt. Um, and I think too, you know, being a minister's child, um, which comes with its own structures and restrictions and gives you all kinds of things to rebel against. Um, it, it, my father told a story from the pulpit every Sunday morning, beginning, middle, and end. You know, you have a larger theme, you have specific examples, and if you're really smart, you have some subtext. Make them laugh, make them cry, send them home. And my dad's an expert at that. He's very, very good. So I think per I would not be um, a writer if I were not his daughter. Um, my mom, my, my mom's not much into book world. She's always been a little suspicious of my career because she loves me and she wants me to be okay. And she's always suggested when I'm having a rough day that I should really consider nursing school. She wanted me to go to nursing school from the beginning. If you get a job, it's good people. It's a clean job, you know. And um, just has never really put her faith in, in publishing. What I loved about mom, though, and how she strengthened me as an author is when I was a little kid, and I would be sent to my room to clean it, which never really happened, I would take a book out, and I would you know, lay in the middle of the mess and read. And mother would come storming up the steps. She's a big woman. You could hear her coming a mile away. And I just have so many memories of her opening the door, getting ready to go, and say, oh, you're reading, honey. And she'd like do the debate in her head, and she'd say, well, finish the chapter, and then you can clean it up. So my room was never cleaned. I've always had something of a conflicted relationship with animals because I have terrible allergies. Um, and uh, I've actually had to get to the point in my life now where I can't have a cat anymore because it's really, you know, it's either the cat or I go to the emergency room, which is just, I can't even go in the tiger house at the zoo because I get, I get like, like scary sick, which is so depressing. I need somebody to really fix the whole allergy thing. Um, but despite those allergies, I just have always loved animals. They've, they've just been a part of my life. I have a German Shepherd now, um, who's not the brightest German Shepherd in the world, but we do love her a lot. 
and she, um, I had a German Shepherd when my kids were growing up. They've just always, it's funny because people say, oh, talk to me about your pets, and I have to think for a moment, do I have, do I have pets? Because they don't feel like pets. They really are, it's a cliche, but it's a really accurate cliche. That's a part of my family. I was kind of surprised when I wound up, um, as a teenager, I was a foreign exchange student, and I went to Denmark. And I did not anticipate that I would be sent to a farm, much less a pig farm. Um, this was the late 70s, and when I left the America, I was a very earnest, you know, sandal-wearing, granola-eating, tree-hugging type girl. Then I landed on a pig farm, of all places, um, and, and worked on the pig farm, did chores, worked in the fields, and uh, got, got a good eye-opening into what farmers do for a living um, and what real work is. I mean, nobody can ever whine to me that, um, like my French were authors, that what we work, do is hard because it's not. We're sitting inside in comfort making stuff up. I mean, how hard is that? If you want hard, go and shovel out a pig barn. That's work. And um, so I had this wonderful experience in Denmark. Um, uh, we, had, we had geese, we had ducks. We slaughtered the geese and ducks at Christmas time to make money for the farm. That was an interesting day. And, um, and I, I think what I didn't anticipate I would come away with from Denmark was a real fondness for bacon <laughs> and, and the inability to become a vegetarian. <laughs> and pork chops, I do love pork chops too. Many people often ask me why it is or how it is that I jump around within the wider genre of children's literature because a lot of people just kind of find their, their alley and they stick to it. And I write the little kid books and a series and contemporary novels and historical fiction and nonfiction and who knows what's coming next. Um, and I, the only answer that I can come up with is I have a very short attention span. I get bored easily, very easily. And if I had to do the same kind of book over and over again, I'd be working on a dairy farm. Because seriously, I mean, what's the point? Not for me, thank you very much. There are two kinds of attention spans. I mean, let me, let me and explain that more carefully. There's like the everyday me getting bored like in five seconds, which is why I don't watch television, because I know how it's going to end. You know, it's like, ugh, I don't know how anybody can do that. Um, but when I find something that is grabbing me by the throat, I have superhuman powers of concentration. Seriously, it's like all I can think, it's like, it's like zero or 60 in my brain. It's no concentration or it's total consumption. And um, it feels so good. It's almost, it almost like, you know, if you're driving a car with a, a, a stick shift and you're having a hard time getting it into gear and you're feeling kind of dumb and the car's making a bad noise and the other people around you are yelling at you. That's what it feels like when I'm sort of bumbling around with lack of focus. When I find that topic and I have my focus, it's like, it's like the, 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 the transmission drops into gear and it's like <laughs> and I take off and I'm gone. I, you're right, I can spend hours in libraries and researching and focus and, I'm, and, and, and I don't know what happened to the day. I look up and, and the sun is down. I think if you look at me and if you know me like my husband knows me, my husband's known me since I was three, so he's sort of the expert. Um, and he looks at the contemporary novels because I read them out loud to him as I'm writing them. And, and he knows clearly kind of where I stop and the character begins. And often there are some you know, even details that I'll pull from my own experience that I'll just hide in a character in the contemporary novels. The historical novels are a little bit different just because my life is so different um, on the surface from those characters um, in Fever, 1793, and in Chains. But I think at a deeper level, um, at a deeper level, uh, both of those characters, Maddie in Fever and Isabel in Chains, have this core rock stubbornness that I was born with. And um, I remember that. I can remember like being their age, like 12, 13, 14, and running up against situations and just inside feeling, OK, well, I'm just going to keep beating this wall till it, it breaks. And it usually worked. I really struggle when people ask me what my favorite books are. Um, first of all, I'm a very, very fussy reader. That 10-page rule that I give to kids, that's the rule I live by. If a book doesn't get me in 10 pages, it goes back. Um, and I, because I'm a little uh, particular about editing, 
If I start to edit a book as I'm reading it, saying, oh, that's a superfluous sentence, or that's a cliche description. If the editor kicks in, I gotta send the book back. So, but when a book grabs me and I lose myself in the book the way I used to when I was a child, then I, I fall head over heels in love because I have that reading experience that's so whew, wonderful. Um, I don't usually read middle grade or YA fiction, however, because I'm really um, concerned that other people's characters, if it's a well-written book and there are so many out there, will get in my head and I'll inadvertently work them into my story and I don't want that. I'm looking forward to taking a year off one of these years and catching up on all of my reading. Now, if one of my kids or like a teacher librarian I, I trust comes up to me or emails me and says, you must read this, you have to read it, um, then I'll read it. And the last book I did that for was Sherman Alexie's Diary of a Part-Time Indian. And I think you should read, I mean, if you haven't, it's a fantastic book and I didn't edit it once. Um, so I read a lot of uh, nonfiction. I read a lot of biographies, a lot of history for fun and, and, and for research. And my beach books are adult mysteries, preferably P.D. James, who's got a new one coming out in 13 days, not that I've been counting. <laughs> Speak was the book that I was never going to write. I, um, although I had a, a fairly pleasant childhood, middle school was hard because we moved around a lot. and. Um, High school was difficult because my family was going through some very, very hard times. And we had moved to a community where I didn't know anybody. We moved just before ninth grade started. And I didn't uh, feel connected at all. And I wound up uh, in the ruts of a pretty profound depression through uh, all of ninth grade. Um, and it kind of lingered for a little while after that. So yeah, I made it through. I mean, I, the reason I went to Denmark to the pig farm was to get the heck out of high school. It was a pretty good survival strategy, all things considered. But you know, as, a, as a young adult and then an adult, I didn't want to spend much time thinking about those years because they weren't much fun. Uh, so I, now we're to the point in my life where I had, uh, my oldest child was in sixth grade, and she was beginning to enter adolescence, um, looking a lot like me, built like me, and running into the same kind of nastiness in middle school. And I think in the back burner of my mind, you know, the subconscious is where all the really good writing takes place all this was accumulating and I was beginning to reflect with some perspective on my own adolescent experiences. And then uh, the December that Stephanie was in sixth grade, I woke up in the throes of a nightmare, a very vivid nightmare in which a girl was sobbing. So vivid that I went down the hall and checked my kids to see if, if anybody was really upset and they were asleep. And I felt, as I fell back asleep after checking the children, I slipped back into the same dream which was this girl sobbing. I was like, oh God. Because I have recurring nightmares all the time, usually a sign that I'm not dealing with something. And so I write about them. I got up that night and turned on my computer and wrote what, after a lot of revision, became the opening pages of Speak. Wasn't gonna write the book, didn't wanna think about adolescent. My oldest kid was only in sixth grade, but clearly I had some things that I needed to process for my own soul. Um, it took me about a year to write the book. I wrote it mostly before the sun came up because I was working as a freelance journalist and um, I was a full-time mom. And when I sent it in, I was sure that nobody would publish the book. Uh, and, and the first publisher I sent it to turned it down. The second publisher liked it, but she assured me that many people wouldn't buy it because teenagers didn't read, is what she said. And the book came out and exploded and went nuclear. Um, in ways that have changed my life and my family's lives forever. National Book Award finalist and all those other incredible awards that really left me feeling like Cinderella for a long time. It wasn't that teenagers don't read, it's that teenagers don't like to read boring books. And nor should they have to. I think a great deal of the illiteracy we have in this country is a direct result of children being force-fed books that do not relate to them. Um, and they come to view books as something um, ugly and shameful and horrible instead of enlightening um, and wonderful. So I'm very proud that my book has become a standard in curriculum across the country. Um, didn't anticipate it at all. Um, kind of took me aback, took me a little while to, to make sense of this. And then when they put the book in, uh, in curriculum, uh, people started to invite me to visit their schools. And in the past decade, I, I visited about half a million high school students. 
and I've talked to them, um, more importantly, I've listened to them. And they've had the courage and the integrity to talk to me. Um, and everything that you know they tell me, I would never take a child's story and turn it into a book. That would be exploitation. But my readers um, let me know, you know what's going on in their lives, where their pains are and where their joys are. And that has led to every single other contemporary novel that I've written. When I first heard from teachers who would write to me about Speak being put in curriculum, I was uh, conflicted because I'd had such bad experiences with books in my own high school English class. The last thing I wanted um, to have happen with my story, because I thought it was a story that kids might like, but thinking back, I just didn't want uh, the book to get mangled, you know, in a series of essays and fill in the blank questions, you know, and do your Venn diagrams and just like. Um, but then I was um, blessed with the, the privilege of sitting in and seeing a lot of these classes, visiting the classes and, and watching how these teachers worked. And this generation of teachers that has come along since I went through high school is extraordinary, extraordinarily smart, compassionate people who recognize that making kids read books that were written 150 years ago, you know, for some children might not be the best avenue towards literacy. And so they're looking for contemporary texts that will work well, you know, that are literature, that can be used as literature, um, but you, they stand a better chance of having the student connect to the text so there's a chance the kid might actually learn something. So I'm thrilled and beyond honored. It just it humbles me that they're putting my story in their classroom. Um, whenever I get to talk to teachers, I do speak at teacher conferences, I do bring up my example and say, you know, lighten up a little bit, please. You know, on the symbolism and the metaphor, when you have a chance, they need to learn it. But remember, what they need more than anything is they need to, to graduate high school loving reading. They need to graduate high school, move to a new community, and have on their to-do list get library card. I'm not going to rest until every single American is literate. And we do that with storytelling, with good storytelling, fiction and nonfiction. And these English teachers now, I think, are, are making a profound difference. So I'm cool with it. I wrote Twisted because so many boys, um, when I visited their classroom to talk about Speak, told me they didn't understand why the main character in Speak was upset after having been raped. And I got that from boys all over America in every demographic, really, really awesome boys who I would let date my daughters. This proved to me that I didn't understand boys. And just parenthetically, the reason that they didn't understand why she was upset is that it wasn't a stranger in the bushes with a gun. It was a hot guy, a senior, that she was on a date with, they were making out, and this is a critical point, um, boys and girls are surrounded by hypersexuality in the media. And so um, if you have a young man with a high testosterone level, seeing all this stuff, and he has no adults in his life who's there to teach him the rules of human dignity, to teach him, well, this is why we don't hurt women, because this is a big deal, and she will be, you know, really traumatized for a long time. Um, that's why we have the sexual assault rates that we have. When you tell boys what the rules are, they're fine. They do a pretty good job, most of them. Um, so anyways, but, but that was the incident that showed me over and over again that I didn't understand boys. So I had a lot of listening to do. And uh, going around the country, um, the boys would explain to me or they'd write to me. And there were three things that kept on coming up um, when they were talking to me about what's going on inside themselves. Number one, almost every single boy I talked to had been at one time or another the victim of a bully. And sometimes he turned around and was a bully himself to move up in the pecking order, but he didn't feel good about it. Number two, Almost every boy I talked to was feeling sad because of the emotional or physical absence of his father. And they didn't know how to do anything about that. Every boy I talked to was confused about girls, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. And I came to the conclusion after listening to and watching these boys for so long that uh, I actually think it might be harder to be a teenage boy in American culture than it is to be a teenage girl because our culture allows teenage girls to express their emotions, you know, sometimes at very dramatic levels, you know, but their, their feelings are getting out and someone's listening to them, hopefully, and they're being validated, and then they can go on. Boys have every bit as rich emotional lives as girls, 
You know, they got all those feelings, but the culture only tells them you're allowed to show anger or rage, preferably on a sports field. And too many boys are feeling like once they get past, you know, 10, 11 years old, they're not allowed to show their feelings. They're not allowed to be tender or to cry or to, you know, have pride in, in an appropriate way. And so all these emotions get buckled down so tightly. And I think this leads to a lot of middle-aged guys being very miserable because they've lost touch with that emotional self. And it makes the teenage boys sometimes do profoundly stupid things, you know, because they're just uh, like this. So I wanted to write about that kid. I wanted to write about, you know, most guys are awesome. I love them. And they're doing so good, you know, especially when they're in schools that don't have strict dress codes and the girls are forgetting to put their clothes on. And that's hard, you know. I'm amazed that more of them aren't walking into walls. Um, and they're just trying to get by. The other thing that was in my mind about Twisted is that I, um, one of my favorite pieces of, of American literature is Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. Just, I think, sums up the last hundred years. And um, that's why in the book, my character is named Tyler Miller. It's kind of a nod a little bit. And in my mind as I was working on the book, I think that Tyler Miller is sort of the literary grandson of Willie Loman. He's coming from a family who has swallowed that consumer culture dream of be popular, be rich, buy a lot of stuff, and you'll be happy. And that's an empty dream. And it, it's the end of Willie. And in Tyler Miller's book, you can see his dad is trying. His dad is doing everything that society is telling him to do, and he's miserable, and he's making his family miserable. And Tyler has a wonderful moment of opportunity, that choice, you know, is going to follow that path or try to uh, blaze his own. So yeah, it was the, get, the writing process of Twisted was incredible, getting into the head of a boy. Again, something I approached with a lot of respect, a lot of research and prayer um, to make sure that please help me do this right. And, and it worked. It worked. I get such great emails. Most of the email from boys is sent uh, between 2 and 4 in the morning. And because they, they, they write to me as soon as they finish the book. And they write to me, and they usually start out saying, dude, I love this book. And then they go on and tell me how it connects to their story. And it's hitting one of those notes every single time. Many of them, many of them have contemplated suicide. And that's just heartbreaking. But the good news is, you know, they've got teachers that are handing them books, they've got librarians that are handing them books, and hopefully we can all be a village, you know, and get them through adolescence and uh, get them through safely. Like all the other YA novels, Winter Girls comes out of my uh, interaction with teenagers. And just a, about three years ago, I started to get a lot of mail and running into girls at book events and at schools who would lean in and whisper or write very quietly um, about their eating disorders and about the pain that was driving their eating disorders and about how trapped they were and they couldn't find and they wanted to get better but they couldn't get better but they didn't really want to get better because everybody said they look really good such such a hard struggle and I didn't want to go there you know because emotionally I've had my own eating issues and and body um, issues I was like oh this is gonna hurt so it's really gonna hurt um, I have a dear friend who's a pediatrician who specializes in adolescent medicine who was a good help because she's a lot of you know these kids and I worked with a psychiatrist who worked um, at an eating disorder clinic. But the really hard work was sort of done internally. Um, I, I lean heavily in this book on the myth of Persephone, who goes down into hell for six months and the world turns into winter. You know, and she's, that's how I see these girls. I see these girls are frozen at an age and at an emotional point that they can't grow past. And the challenge is, you know, really how much do you want to live? Um, and can you live? So that was by far the most emotionally draining books I've written. It puts everything else in, 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 it's in a league of its own. So when I finished it, I was like, I was so grateful to be able to write about something uplifting, you know, like slavery. You know, it's just, but seriously, at the end of that book, and this happened with Twisted too, um, at the end of my YA novels, I'm convinced that I'll never write another YA. And that's why it's so lovely to be able to venture into history, because history, 
all those details and all those lives, they provide their own metaphor. I mean, the details that I found in runaway slave ads that gave me clues into what people, when people, if you have a little bit of a choice, even a little choice about what you're wearing, what you carry with you when you're escaping, says a lot about who you are. So the historical details just give me this, this, this gorgeous garden to harvest from in terms of the writing. Um, that's a, an external source. For the YA stuff, it tends to be more internal, and that, that drains me. So I'm very happily in the middle of Valley Forge right now, feeling bad for those guys, but loving some of the details that they left for me. Um, and I'm waiting for the universe to point me in the right direction for the next YA novel. And I keep on testing out, oh, maybe I'll write about this, maybe I'll write about that. But I know, it's like I, I can feel it now. It's like, it's like, you know, when, when you're dating, you're like, oh, this is a nice fella. Oh, he's kind of a good fella. And then you date that guy, that one, and your heart stops. And you're just like, ah! That's how I'll know that the next book is here, because that's what it feels like. Fever 1793 um, for me started in a newspaper article that was written in 1993, get it? 200 years, right? Um, the Philadelphia Inquirer, because I was living outside Philly, um, a museum exhibit had been put together that examined this epidemic that nearly wiped out the city when the city was the capital of the United States. And I'm a big history geek, and I had never heard about this epidemic. Um, so I was reading the article, and I was struck, A, by that fact, that it was a little known, really important thing in American history, and it was disgusting. Yellow fever is not a nice disease. It's very gory, and you puke up blood, and it's like uh, people dying all over the streets. And I realized that between the disgusting factor and the history thing, I had the perfect book for children. This was going to go over very well with my readers. But I needed to do a ton of research. Um, so I did. I lived close to Philly, I'd put the kids in the bus, take the subway down into town and go to the Pennsylvania Historical um, Society at 13th and Locust Street and just read, read, read. Found out years later, incidentally, that at the same time period, Jim Murphy was also there. We didn't know each other then. And he was researching what became his nonfiction book about that exact same epidemic. So he must have seen the same article. Because we were like on the same wavelength. It's very cool. The books are taught together and that's, that, that's lovely. Um, so the, the, it was, Fever 1793 was really an apprentice work for me. I wrote it before I wrote Speak. Um, I actually got it to draft eight and it was still pretty bad so I put it down, took that year and wrote Speak and the writing of Speak in that first person point of view taught me so much about how to get inside a character's head that I went back, changed the point of view of Fever and revised it a bunch more times until it was ready to be published. Um, I did have one incident where a child heard uh, an early section of the book and made me tone things down because I am a little bloodthirsty. I brought the chapter to my daughter's fifth grade classroom in which the mom in the book has to be bled because she's so ill. And it was, it was pretty detailed. And I read it out loud and the room was warm and it was after lunchtime and a little girl in the back of the room went <laughs> passed right out cold. And as a mom, you know, I'm like, oh my god, I'm horrified. Everyone's making a big deal. But this little part of me, the writer part, was like, yes, I did it. But then I went back and I changed it because you don't want your readers dropping over. That's not nice. Um, so that was an interesting experience. Also interesting for me is that that book was turned down by almost every publisher in New York um, because there used to be eight extra chapters in the beginning of the book. Ch what is now chapter one used to be chapter nine because I thought I needed to set up the world of the characters to engage the readers in the world of Philadelphia in that time period and then start killing people off. And no editor ever got past the first chapter because they were boring, nothing was happening. So finally I came to my senses and got rid of those early eight chapters, started the book, by the end of the first chapter you hear word, you don't see it, but you hear word of a death um, because it really was a very, very intense time. Um, I loved working on that book. I just loved sub submerging myself in all of that research. And there was a fact that I came across when I was researching Fever 1793 that years later led to the writing of my new historical novel, Chains. When I was reading Fever, I came across the fact that Benjamin Franklin had been a slave owner. And I didn't know that. Nobody taught me that. They always talked about his servants in his books. 
And when I first read it, I was like, no, you're making that up. So I did, you know, went to the bi footnotes, bibliography's primary source, and I discovered that he owned slaves from 1735 to 1781. And we have primary source evidence that he owned at least seven people, in addition to which he made money off of runaway ads and facilitating as a printer and kind of a central gathering place the return of runaway slaves to their owners. And this slayed me. It just, my hero, there's this big crash as my hero falls off his pedestals. And I was so confused, you know, because I think like a lot of Americans, particularly white Americans, I had swallowed that cup of selective amnesia that allows us to say, well, yeah, Washington and Jefferson were slave owners, but, and, and not focus in on the ugly truth. So I filed that fact away and worked on a couple of other books. And as I was researching independent dames, women in American history, in American Revolution, I came across more evidence of slave holding in the North. And I was like, I don't understand this. I, nobody taught me this. I don't get it. I have to read about it. So I did a lot of researching into slavery in the North, which was insidious and widespread. In 1776, one in five people in New York City was a slave. 20% of the population. Abigail Adams's father, the Reverend William Smith, was a slave owner in Boston. He owned Phoebe and Tom. Um, Abigail's husband, John, and their son, John Quincy, were the only two of our first 12 presidents who didn't own slaves. And so I, the, these facts are accumulated. There's a whole lot more that I could go on about for several hours. Read my book. They're in there. Um, but these facts accumulated. And for, I, for a long time, I didn't know if I could write the book. Um, I'm thinking about what would it be like to be a slave when everybody around you is talking about liberty and freedom. But as an American, I was so upset and devastated and confused by this that I was um, kind of, you know, lost, very lost. Um, but it was, you know, I, I kept on focusing in on, on the character. I went to an exhibit at the New York Historical Society. It was, called, it was a wonderful exhibit called Slavery in New York. And there was a sculpture of a man and a woman, um, African American, trying to run away at the beginning of the exhibit. And it was made of very thin wire. And it's just their outlines, very detailed. Um, and I stopped dead when I saw that sculpture because it was ghostly. And I realized that I had ghosts at so many levels in my head at this point, um, and that many white people in all the colonies um, did not see uh, black people as fellow Americans. They were ghosts. They were their property. They were real estate. And I heard my character's voice in my head for the first time standing in front of that wire sculpture. And she said, the best time to talk to ghosts is just before the sun comes up. I wrote it down in my little notebook, and I was off, off to the races. Um, you know, I discovered all the stuff I didn't know about New York City in 1776 and, and sort of where, where people's thinking was. Um, by the end of the book, I had come through a transformation uh, as an American. Because while it was the aristocracy, many of them slave owners who led the war effort and the movement to freedom, and a very brilliant man uh, who I honor and have a lot of respect for those decisions. But it, they didn't win the war. It was ordinary people, poor people, desperately poor people, and slaves, and women, who struggled and sacrificed for years and years to break free of England. And when I really had a better understanding of the work of the ordinary people, um, including slaves, there were 5,000 African American men, free and enslaved, who fought for the patriot side. And what united all of these people, why are they fighting for this cause led by the American aristocracy? They're fighting because they believed in the language of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and that are united by these common li you know, liberties and these, these God-given things. And folks believed that language. That was so powerful. And, and so when I got to the end of the book, I was like, you know, I can still love Ben Franklin and Washington and Jefferson. At the same time, feeling very sad that they blew it when it came time to write the Constitution. Um, because they put the elephant in our living room that we're still struggling with. Our sin of racism in America today is a direct result of A, their actions, and B, our misunderstandings about slavery. So for me, the American Revolution is not quite over yet. 
um, we still have, I, and I kind of took on a new mantle for myself um, personally, um, and, and, and Isabel has helped me with all this, like my character is so alive. Because um, she has to choose, she has to make her own freedom, because no one's going to give it to her. And I kind of see that that's all of our responsibility if we're ever going to be, if we're ever going to fulfill the dream of our revolution, is to realize that we all have to make our own freedom and make it for each other. And I'm very happy to report that we are now, at this point, closer than I've ever seen in my lifetime to fulfilling that dream. And maybe our revolution is about to be over. We'll see. By the time I got changed to the point where, you know, it wasn't final draft, but we're nearing final draft, and, and then other voices were starting. In change, she's got this friend named Corzon, who's a young man, and he's very vibrant in my head, and, and he's whispering to me about all the things that he wants to do. So the book I'm working on right now is Corzon's story. He continues their story. It's not really a series in that the narrator shifts, but it's linked books. And he's a soldier for the Patriot cause. They've run away, so he's calling himself a free man, and he believes in these dreams. And it largely is centered at the Valley Forge Winter, which is the crucible of the Continental Army, which has been very cool to write about. And then the third book, as I have it planned now, I haven't done all the research, but I'm look, I want to look in the third book at the end of the war, the Southern Campaign, which was really bloody and hard and hideous um, in the Carolinas, and then ending up in Yorktown and, and, and Virginia. And you know the way that a lot of these issues regarding slavery and freedom were dealt with at the end of the Revolutionary War is what sets us up for the Civil War. Um, and I think if we can have a better understanding of those connections, we'll see our history as, as an arc, and things will make more sense to folks. Let me tell you a story about my daughter, Meredith. Meredith was not a reader. This is the worst thing you could do if your mom is an author. She just didn't like to read, kind of like me, short attention span, lots of energy. And, but she didn't get the reading bug. And she was reading well below grade level, which was a great concern for us, uh, until she got to seventh grade. And in seventh grade, they did a unit on the Holocaust. And Meredith came to me and said, big eyes, mommy, did that happen? And I said, well, yes, baby. My, my father was an American soldier who entered uh, concentration camps at the end of the war. So we have this family connection. And she said the words I've been waiting to hear. She said, do they have any books about this? I was like, yes. I said, I think they do. I, and we then amassed the largest juvenile fiction collection about the Holocaust that anyone has ever put together. And Meredith's reading level jumped something like three grade levels in one year because she couldn't stop reading. All she wanted to read was fictional books about the Holocaust. And I got to the point where I was concerned. It was kind of dark stuff for my happy-go-lucky seventh grader to be wading through. And I said to her, baby, why do you keep reading about this? And she said, mommy, I'm trying to figure out what I would have done. And I was like, what? She said, well, I keep on like reading these characters, and I'm trying to figure out if it was me who was a German or a Dutch person, how would I have reacted? If, would I have taken people into my house? If I was a Jew, would, what would I have done? How would I have saved my family? Would I have run? Would I have fought? Would I have hit? What would I, I keep on thinking, and I haven't figured it out yet. And that was a big eye-opening experience to me. And since then, talking to kids, because fever's in curriculum all over the place, and the letters I've gotten from children, show me that our children need historical stories in order to develop their own sense of morality. Not only do the stories teach them history when they don't even realize they're being taught history, you know, it's painless, but it's easier for them, I think, this is my theory anyways, it's easier for them to put themselves in a difficult situation that's at a historical remove. Because especially middle grade, that's still kind of young, that's still very vulnerable. And to put themselves in modern situations is scary because it's right there in your face. Um, but you can put yourself in the situation of somebody who went through hard times in a different time period and you have a little bit of a buffer and you can close the book. And our kids grow up by learning these stories. Traditionally this is what we've done. This is how we've passed our values from one generation to the other. Um, is by telling our children and our grandchildren our stories and where we come from. Historical accuracy is my best friend. 
Now, people who write books for grown-ups are lazy, <laughs> and they get away with murder. And I guess there's probably some part of me that's jealous of that, but I'm hiding that um, by pretending that I actually love the fact that we are held to um, higher standards, and we are. In children's literature, you can't get away with making up facts um, about the history um, because you have School Library Journal. And you have all these really smart teachers who don't want to introduce false information into their classroom. So the way it works for me and my editors, I'm, I'm a little obsessive about this because I really do want to get it right as much as you can get it right when you're talking about interpreting events um, that are so long ago. But I, um, I have to write bibliographies for my books, which my fifth grade teacher, she's probably dead now, is laughing about in her grave. You can find the bibliography for Chains on my website, by the way, in case anybody wants to read it. That's just me showing off my research. Um, but then I work with historians. Uh, one of the historians for Chains uh, let me go through her files and use some of her own primary source research. And I had uh, three, three different historians read the entire manuscript and an additional historian read one piece of it um, to make sure, because you have two layers of storytelling here. The historical storytelling is actually nonfiction. That plot thread, you know, Washington's assassination, the, the plot to assassinate Washington, the fire of that summer, the British invasion, um, the, 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 uh, the state of slavery, that's all nonfiction. But what's braided into that is the life and times and thoughts and heart of a fictional character. So I have to make sure that my bedrock is firm and then I can build upon it. And it's actually kind of cool. Um, I, I think, you know, because I, I can take a lot of pride in it. And I can take pride in it because educators um, really need us to keep our standards high. So it's a nice thing. There was one moment when, when, when Speak, when we went through the festivities for Speak. This is the most special moment about this whole event for me. And it was when all 20 nominees, because there's four categories and um, five finalists in each category. So the 20 of us are in the small green room just before we go out to give our reading for the public, the day before the, the winners announced. And we're in this tiny little green room, and we're all feeling awkward, because we all work in our pajamas at home in our attic. And we're dressed up, you know, and we're introverts. And we're in this room. And the director was there, and he had our medals. And he took the medals out, and he put them around each of our necks and said something gracious. And it was so cool that nobody else was there to see it, because everybody in that room understood the struggle. They understood the struggle of hearing the voices, of feeling kind of weird, of having this incredibly arrogant dream, which it really is, and then f wading through doubt um, and making it. And now here we are, and it was like such a great uh, peer moment, and they, everybody understood that that was a highlight for me. So I'm looking forward to doing that again. Oh, I've got so many things going on, it's so exciting. Um, I'm doing the early writing of Forge, that's the follow-up to Chains, that's the historical. I was at Valley Forge a couple weeks ago in the archives. Um, need to go back in the winter time and like strip down to my shorts and t-shirt and walk around barefoot to really get the sense, you know. Um, and, it, and once I get that into a readable draft, my books usually take seven drafts. And once I get that to the readable draft, then I'll start the research for, for Ashes. I'm doing the research for the Abigail Adams book. I need to come up with some new titles for Zoe Fliefenbacher, She of the Red Hair. That's fun. That's just fun stuff. Um, and I, I don't know what my next uh, YA novel will be. Um, that's a little anxiety-provoking for me. This happens every time.